Good morning. Welcome to Breakfast and Bible Study presented by First Presbyterian Church of Bradenton, Florida. You can join us here most every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock by going to our church website at bradenton.church slash zoom and clicking the link for Breakfast and Bible Study. And with that, I will we will continue our uh, study into the um excuse me, continue our study into the uh, uh, not spiritual gifts, um, fruits of the spirit. Thank you. There you uh, go. And uh, Patty Lee, thank you. Thank you, Dwayne. Yes, um, I'm using the book by Dr. David Jeremiah. It's a life beyond amazing nine decisions. There are nine fruits of the spirit that will transform your life today. And last week we had joy, but I'm going to just finish with a little bit of joy before we get into peace. Let's come together for an opening prayer, please. Dearest Heavenly Father, we thank you that Dwayne is much better from his COVID. We pray for Nancy as she still is having trouble with bronchitis. We pray, dear Lord, that you will heal her soon so that she can get back to the things she is used to doing. And we give you joy and we, we're, we're blessed with joy for Barbara's great grandson that was born early. We pray for the whole family and the new baby that uh, he is healthy and um, for his mom that, that is having a little difficulty because it was a hard labor. Be with us as we study your word on peace. Many times we need peace and we pray that the Holy Spirit will open our hearts so that we can understand how we get peace and how the Holy Spirit gives, us to, gives it to us once we become a Christian. So we ask that you be with us as we enter your word and may it change our hearts and our lives. For we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'm going to go over a little bit of things that uh, I didn't get to mention before. I'll try to talk a little faster. But uh, this is something that David Jeremiah has said, and I really like it. I have this starred in my book. <clears throat> excuse me, the Holy Spirit is the purveyor of joy. When you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes to live within you. He becomes ever present in your life. This is part of the gift of salvation, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Throughout your life, you get to decide whether to turn your life over to his guidance. When you decide to give him control of your life, he will bring his joy to you. And I like what he says. He says he often tells this to his congregation. As I often tell my congregation, the Holy Spirit does not want to be a resident in your life. He wants to be the president of your life. I really like that. Now, let me see what else that I have forgotten. Okay, this is Jesus' word. These are Jesus' words from John 16, 24, which you have looked at. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. We can pray for joy when you're troubled, when you're stressed, when you're feeling low, when you have disappointment, sorrow, or fear, we want to pray our pain or our anxiety away. So we can pray for joy, and that's the one thing that we can ask for. And it doesn't have to be a yay, yay, hooray kind of joy. It can be a quiet joy, too. A very quiet joy that's a comforting joy that brings you, like <clears throat> we're going to talk about today, some peace. It can be a reassuring joy, an uplifting joy, the main joy of knowing that you're not alone. Uh, in the words of scholar William Barclay, which Duane, who Duane loves, 
uh, to read, the Christian is the man of joy. The Christian is the laughing cavalier of Christ. A gloomy Christian is a contradiction in terms, and nothing in all religious history has done Christianity more harm than its black clothes and long faces. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. true isn't it and i remember yeah. Dwayne. you know even the days that we had communion he would always dress in in um happy colors and he would he would say this is a happy time you know not a time for for black and so on and i have one more story that i wanted to show you it's under his other book, Living with Confidence in a Chaotic World by David Jeremiah, which gives us hope in uncertain times like today. And he tells the story, and this is really a gripping story. And I think it goes both to uh, peace and joy. Um, he says that in Campus Life magazine, there was a story. The author was Shannon Etheridge. And she remembered a terrible day from her 11th year in high school. She was trying to put on lipstick while she was driving. And we know that that's something that you should never do. And she was on a bumpy country road. And she struck. Yeah. But the next part isn't, isn't that happy. She struck and killed a bicyclist. And that was the beginning of her nightmare. And what stunned her most was that the victim's husband said upon being told he had lost his wife, his first question was, and I'm having chills already, how is the girl, was she hurt? That was his very first question. So it was inconceivable to Etheridge that, uh, that anyone could take such a devastating blow as to, to lose uh, the wife, his wife and then be worried about the person that caused the accident. So the night before the funeral, she forced herself to visit the bereaved husband. And she says, and she wrote, as I entered the house, I looked down the entry corridor to see a big burly middle-aged man coming toward me, not with animosity in his eyes, but with his arms open wide. The man was a Wycliffe Bible translator, and I forgot to ask my friend if he knows him, named <laughs> Gary Jartsper. He gave her a large, compassionate embrace, and she dissolved into tears. Over and over, she wept the words, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. And he gently spoke to her about the life and legacy of his beloved wife. He said, God wants to strengthen you through this. He wants to use you. As a matter of fact, I am passing Marjorie's legacy of being a godly woman over to you. I want you to love Jesus without limit, just like Marjorie did. He insisted that all the charges against her be dropped. And... Um, then he began to look out for her and to encourage her in the development of her life. He wrote, Gary's merciful, she wrote, Etheridge wrote, Gary's merciful actions, along with his challenging words to me that night before Marjorie's funeral, would be my source of strength and comfort for years to come. The logic of each behavior is never found in the world, but only in the word. These actions are not found in our world today. They are, but they're rare, but they're found in the word. And a thought came to me as I looked over this again, reminding myself I was going to uh, tell you this. You know, sometimes, uh, not sometimes, often we don't understand the tragedies that occur, the earthquakes, the cyclones, the tornadoes, and the people that are injured or hurt or killed. And just a thought popped into my head, and I, I can say it was the Holy Spirit. I'm sure it didn't come from me. But I thought, how, how can 
we be comforted at that time? And the thought came to me, they died as martyrs to Christ. Because so many times, because of those disasters, many people come to Christ. And, I, and the thought came to me, I think maybe God views them as martyrs for Christ's sake, for bringing people to Christ because of the devastating uh, things that happen during those times. Okay, let's now go into a life of peace. And as I said before, peace is not the absence of stress, but the presence of the Savior. And this is from Dr. Jeremiah. And I thought that was great. Now he, um, Jesus Christ was often called the Prince of Peace. Peace. That's right, the Prince of Peace by Isaiah the prophet. And we know that we have studied Isaiah, and that comes from Isaiah 9 6, mm -hmm. because Isaiah saw another day coming. He saw the prophetic time that was going to come when there would be total peace he saw it from genesis to revelation the final peace of god and uh as in isaiah 2 4 i am quoting and you have it there one of your verses beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks nation shall not lift up sword against nation neither shall they learn war anymore. And so that is our in our hearts for the longing of peace from Isaiah. And we certainly do love Isaiah. Okay. And around the world, there are many uh, commemorative statues of peace. Does anyone know some that they can mention around the world? Isn't it on top of the White House? Um, I'm not sure, but God, yeah, there is a statue on top of the White House. I never yeah. thought of that. Yeah. yeah. I think that's yeah. true. Yeah, I think so too. Well, I will have to look that up. Neat. <laughs> okay. Well, for one, our own Statue of Liberty is I was going to say the oh, Statue yeah. of Liberty. Is yes, <clears throat> that's one from us. And it means we are offering a gesture to peace to those that come to us. Uh, from lands of war and where uh, they're living in another country and it's it's not safe. It's our desire to have peace in the world. And there are other places that have statue and I've never seen this, but I, I would have liked to. The Christ of the Andes, yeah. uh, the huge Christ with his yeah. arms open between Chile and Argentina. <laughs> right. I think that's a a uh, beautiful, beautiful statue. It's a gigantic figure and it's expressing hope for peace. In Paris, there's a wall for peace at the front of the Eiffel Tower. And uh, and then there's there, there's a glass monument that has the word peace written in 49 languages. And people are, are invited to come and put messages of peace uh, in the cracks. In Tokyo, there's a robust statue with arms outstretched toward heaven and written underneath the statue in Greek and Japanese is the word agape. Oh, love is the word agape, love. We went over that last week, so that that's amazing. Um, so we know there are many, many uh, peace and joy and we are called the sons of God. And if it's possible, as much as depends upon us, we need to pass that on as being children and sons of God, that it depends upon us, each individual, to live peacefully with others. You know, we often say, well, you know, this and that and that country and that person, and it, it has to start here. It has to start with us. So let's make it our mission to start with peace. Um, there's an old French word. It's, oh, I did, um, I mentioned, I wanted to remember to tell, and I forgot this, um, Dwayne, the, um, the, the story, it, the story I said about the, that the flag, uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, I wanted to tell you, it was, it was a headmaster, here it is. 
He was a headmaster at a boarding school in London. And one of his students once remarked, he thought the headman went, the headmaster went to heaven every night and stayed there and then came <laughs> down to earth because every day he walked in with such joy in his heart. And he, he really believed that. But one day the headmaster was asked why he was filled with so much joy. And in his response, it was, and we said this last week, joy is the flag that is flown from the castle of your heart when the king is in residence. So remember, we're not supposed to have the king or the Holy Spirit as residence in us. We're supposed to have him as the president. president. President within us. Very good. Okay, we got that one. Anyway. You know, I happen to think maybe that statue in the White House is freedom. I don't remember now, but could be free. Well, that, it, that it's actually be. on it's on the Capitol and, and yes, it is the Statue of Freedom. Okay. Yeah. Very good, Pat. Thank you. Thank you. Well, another one we didn't realize. Okay. We've often heard the word peace originates from an old French word meaning reconciliation, silence, agreement, the absence of hostility. Um, this word. The Hebrew word, what is the Hebrew word for peace? Shalom. Shalom. Oh, shalom. Shalom. Uh -huh. shalom. And we know that also, you know, people sometimes say shalom in the Jewish community as they as they greet each other. Um, but it is the um, Hebrew word for peace. And that word is found over 200 times in the Old Testament. Yeah. And... Um, <clears throat> It's the concept of having your integrity, your body, your soul, your whole being, and your spirit in alignment. That there's no hostility. It's the absence of hostility. It means everything is set right. You're fulfilled. You're complete. You're sound. You're mature. You're whole. You have harmony, tranquility, security. All of those words bring about peace. Shalom means it is well in my life. And it's also hello and goodbye. It's like yes, peace it is. with you it is. and peace send, send you out. Right. Yes. So that's a beautiful word. We can say that to each other. Shalom. You know, as we greet each other, as we say goodbye and bringing each other peace. I think that's beautiful. So um, we're not in control of our lives, but the spirit of God is in control of our lives. And the spirit wants to bring us peace. Um, the Dr. Jeremiah was diagnosed. He didn't know this. The doctor hadn't told him. And he was he was in the hospital because he had some form of cancer, but he didn't know how bad, bad it was. And he was walking around the halls and he decided to take a second lap. He was told to exercise and he was really pushing himself to take a second lap. And by a strange coincidence, his doctor was talking into the machine that was recording, you know, his history. And um, he was dictating his notes. So Dr. Jeremiah said when he shuffled by his desk, he heard the doctor say, a pastor who has stage four large cell lymphoma cancer. And he was shocked. He was stunned. And he, he hadn't known how serious his condition was. And after that, his only thought was, well, tomorrow I'll have to even do another lap because I'm in the arms of God. He's, he's going to take care of me. So I'll just do another lap, do all I can to make myself stronger. And he's he's been free of cancer ever since. So... He's just a, a marvelous human being. But Paul wrote, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And this is from your Romans 5.1. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It means the cessation of hostility. Why would Paul need to have a cessation of or a stop to hostility? Why would he have to have that in his life? 
because it's I a can't blockage. Really imagine Paul not being hostile. Um, if if I were in his position, you know the the uh, yeah. physical tribulations that he had, <clears throat> constant uh, harassment that he faced for uh, for preaching the word. He he did not lead a a pleasant um, <laughs> flying around in a private jet kind of life. Oh right, right, right. He had yeah, so but... much hostility in his life because it was coming at him. So he needed to have the peace inside to be able to come out. Exactly, exactly. And, and when we can point to him, you know, when when we think of, well, what did what did the apostles, what did the disciples go through? Well, I think he probably went through more than any of them, except most of them were were martyred for their faith, were killed for their faith. Um, the and he and Dr. Jeremiah says the peace Jesus brings changes the image of God from a his fisted hand with a gavel to the outstretched hand of a friend. God's anger at us because of our sin is put away. He loved us so much that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. God adopts us into his family. And from now on, all his dealings with us are good. And we've got to believe that he will never be against us. He is our father and our friend, and we don't need to be afraid anymore. God has brought us together through Jesus Christ. And he said, Dr. Jeremiah said, you know, there's often the picture of um, Christ reaching up to God, holding on to God and reaching down to us through the cross. Mm -hmm. And in that image, we are forgiven. We have been brought together with Jesus Christ and he is our peace. As you have read in your verses, for he himself, meaning Christ is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, made us one with God because God cannot handle sin god cannot look upon sin and that's why when christ died there was a blackness and the curtain was rent because at that time <clears throat> god was separated from christ and he became full sin for us god could not look upon him and so jesus holds his hand up to god and his hand down to us while he's on the cross and you once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now Christ, he, has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless, blameless and above reproach in his sight, which you read in First Colossians. And, and, that's, and here he is explaining that again, just like I told you. The cross points up to heaven, it points down to earth with Christ in between. And Jesus said in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives to you. The world doesn't bring us peace. Not as the world will give you, I will give it to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Amen. Did someone want to say something? No, that's, that's that's one of my yeah, favorites. Right. Yeah. And if we can be a testimony to others, when others know that that um, we shouldn't be at peace because of illness, because of sorrow or grief or something else that has happened to us from the outside, remember Mary, as you said, a uh, happening from the outside, but from the inside, we are given peace. Because the Holy Spirit, through Christ, has brought us that peace. Um, so I, I love that. And then, as you had in John 20, 19 through 20, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side when he was with his apostles. The same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, and the disciples were assembled, 
where did he come from? He came, just came to them. Not opening a door, just came to them and was there. And he said, peace be with you. And all he did was show his hands and his side um, for the purpose of that they knew that this was Christ himself, that there was no question about it. Peace be with you. So we have peace. We are assured of peace. And we have the peace of God. In Philippians, it says, the peace of God, Philippians 4, 7, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And when the apostle wrote these words, he was a prisoner in Rome, and he was lightless in a dungeon, and he still was able to write those words. He relied, as we're talking about Paul, relied on the peace of God to help him survive. And others watching him, you know, when he was able to sing, um, you know, hymns in the in the in the cave in the prison, and and be able to survive in his difficult situation, uh, he would. The faith of God was born in him, and he trusted in God. Um, <laughs> David Jeremiah says, "While everything is going crazy out there." And, <laughs> you know, when we hear the news, we say everything is going crazy out there. There is a quiet center in your life that keeps you going and going how? Going in the right direction, because that's when we need to pray that the Holy Spirit guide us in the direction that we should go. Even when everything is piling on, you know, guide me, Holy Spirit in the direction that I should go. And David Jeremiah says, there are four main highways upon which the peace of God travels. And listen to these. He travels through the spirit of God. You can write this down. He travels through the spirit of God, the son of God, the word of God, and prayer. Four main highways upon which the peace of God travels. The Spirit of God, the Son of God, the Word of God, and prayer. When Jesus was teaching his disciples, he told them he had to leave them. And of course, they didn't understand whenever he told them that. He told them about the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit would come to help them. Of course, at this time, they, they didn't feel it. They didn't know the Holy Spirit yet. And um, when Jesus was finished with all his instruction about the Holy Spirit, he said, in John 16, 33, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Christ is the spirit of peace. And that's why the fruit of the spirit means peace. It's the inevitable result of the spirit of God controlling your life. But he doesn't control your life unless you ask him to. He doesn't force. He doesn't push. He doesn't admonish and say i'm gonna pull your ear and make you go this way <laughs> that's all yeah you know he doesn't okay come on like you do to a child that's uh not i mean i i don't do that to a child but you know it's the image of someone saying okay come on get with it um it's he's there waiting for you to let him have control and in that way, you'll have a little bit more peace. Um, let me see. Oh, yeah. This is another story that he tells about. And this is from 2012, not too long ago. Kara and Jason Tippetts, and they had four beautiful children. They moved to Colorado Str Springs to begin the adventure of a lifetime. They were going to start a church. And that's a wonderful thing to do. And during this time, Kara decided 
to start a simple mommy blog. It was called Mundane Faithfulness, dedicated to chronicling her family's journey and helping other moms deal with all the parent things that I had to, but she was trying to bring kindness and love to them. But, I, but during that summer, when they had just moved to start a church, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And um, she was in a place that was difficult for her. And soon her growing, her following grew as she was writing. She put these things on a blog and a publisher discovered her blog. And in the fall of 2014, her first book, The Hardest Place was published. It was released then by two more in the subsequent years. Just over a year later on March 22nd, 2015, she gave up her life and went to live with Christ and went to live be with God. And she went home to Jesus. But her blog and books continued to be an inspiration. And here is what she wrote. My little body has grown tired of battle and treatment is no longer helping. But what I see, what I know, what I have is Jesus. He has still given me breath and with it, I pray, I would live well and fade well. By degrees, doing both, living and dying, as I have moments left to live. I get to draw my people close, kiss them, and tenderly speak love over their lives. I get to pray into eternity my hopes and fears for the moments of my loves. I get to laugh and cry and wonder over heaven. I do not feel like I have the courage for this journey, but I have Jesus, and he will provide. He has given me so much to be grateful for, and for that gratitude, that wondering over his love will cover us all, and it will carry us, carry us in ways we cannot comprehend. In the hardest days of her life, Kara Tibbetts was marked by an amazing sense of gratitude and love. She was carried by a peace beyond comprehension, a peace only the Holy Spirit can provide. And uh, David Jeremiah says that he saw this on a church billboard once, and it said, no Christ in O, not the other no. The first one is no, N-O Christ, no peace. K-N-O-W Christ, K-N-O-W peace. Without Christ, there's no peace. With Christ, we will know peace. When Jesus was trying to talk to his disciples and before his departure, he encouraged them with these words. And these are from John 14, 1 and 27. And you have these had these to read. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Peace I leave with you. My I peace do. I give to you. I do. I do not not do. as the world gives do yes. I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. And again, John 16. And I, we can try to read it together. Some of our Bibles might be different, but let's try it. It'll be a, a uh, what do we say that? What is that word? Uh, oh, I can't think of the word. Cacophony. Huh? What is it? Cacophony. Cacophony. Thank you. You got it. Yeah. I don't know how it's pronounced. I only know how it reads. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Marge. Thank you. In the world, you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Um, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. How many of us remember what we've learned in the history books? We weren't old enough to hear it. What Winston Churchill did for England, for the English during World War II. Um, during the Blitz in London in World War II, when German bombs were raining down on London, the people lived in constant fear. And we can think of this as Ukraine. I mean, it's, it's just 
mind blowing how things keep going back and forth. It's hard for us to imagine the kind of deep, pervasive anxiety, even terror, that results from continual bombardment. During those dark days, one man's undaunted voice would regularly ring out from radios all over the nation, inspiring them to new hope and new belief. Their cause was just. Their government was resolute. Their armies would not fail them. The people listened and took heart with what he said. Um, and it's similar to us. I, when he was writing this, the Middle East was having problems. Now we're, we're coming back to that. And um, in Ukraine and, and other areas. Uh, deserted by God, this is uh, Sinclair Ferguson told the, the following story in his work, Deserted by God. The first and um, we, the first physician to die of the AIDS virus in the United Kingdom was a young Christian. He had contracted it while doing medical research in Zimbabwe. In the last days of his life, his power of communication failed. He struggled with increasing difficulty to express his thoughts to his wife. On one occasion, he simply could not. Uh, she could not understand what he was trying to say. And so he wrote, he, all he could do was write on a newspaper, the letter J. She ran through her medical dictionary saying various words beginning with a J. None was right. Then she said, Jesus, that was the right word. He was with them. That was all either of them wanted to know. That was always enough. And again, Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. We know of Job 34, 29, when he gives quietness, who then can make trouble? And in 2 Thessalonians, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. Um, there are a hundred, a hundred, the Psalm, and you only had one of the, <laughs> one of the verses, the Psalm 119 is 176 verses long. Psalm 119. It's the longest chapter in the Bible, but it extols the virtues of God. And, um, Give peace, this is verse 165 of the 176. Great peace have those who love your law and nothing causes them to stumble. And of the 27 New Testament books, 18 begin with a greeting of peace. 18 of the books in the New Testament. And that's because there's no peace unless God gives his grace to you. And unless you experience the grace of God, you can't have peace. And early Christ Christians used that as a greeting. The official greeting Paul used to introduce himself, as he is, especially when he wrote his letters, was, does anyone peace. remember? I think you have it, Mary. Grace, peace be with you. Grace and peace, peace be with you. And peace be with you. Yes, that was his his beginning of greeting himself. Grace and peace be with you. Um, Patty, oh, Patty, just okay. as a time check, we're about 40 minutes right now. Okay. All right. Let's see. Ah, we're almost done with this chapter. This was one of his shorter chapters. <laughs> okay, I'm going to tell you the story about a wounded soldier came home from the war and at a supper honoring veterans, he was asked to share the most wonderful thing he'd experienced while he was on tour. And he thought about it and, he, and in a moment he replied, I was walking near my trench one day when I saw a young soldier lying on the ground intently reading a book. I went up to him and asked what he was reading. He told me he was reading the Bible. Now, I had read the Bible for many years, but it never did me any good. But this soldier said to me, listen to what I am reading. And he read, let not your heart be troubled. 
in my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. Neither let your heart be afraid. The soldier explained that he responded to the scripture by saying that he'd read it many times and it had never done him any good. Give it up, man, he said. Give it up. But the other soldier looked down from where he was reading on the ground and said, if you knew what the Bible means to me, you would never ask me to give it up. As he spoke, said the soldier, the light of his face was so bright, I never saw anything like it in my life. It just dazed me. I could not look at it for long, so I turned and walked away. Soon after that incident, a bomb fell near the place where they had been speaking. When the dust cleared, he went to check on the young soldier who had been reading the Bible. He found him fatally wounded, the Bible sticking out of his breast pocket. And here it is, said the soldier to the audience. I want to say to you today who have gathered here at this occasion that the most wonderful thing I experienced during the war was the light on that young soldier's face. And more than that, I can say now that his savior is my savior too. For I read that book and I came to know the one who gave him peace in the midst of war. And that connects to what I was thinking before. That soldier was a martyr for Christ. It reminds me of uh, the centurion who looked up at Christ and said, Surely he is the son of God. Yes. <clears throat> That's wonderful too. Yes. And the thief on the cross. Yeah. And the thief yep. on the cross. Yes. Um, <clears throat> in other words, peace and prayer. In other words, we must be anxious for nothing, prayerful for everything, and thankful <clears throat> for anything thankful for anything. The Christian is very differently situated here. This uh, Norman Harrison says, and I'm going to end with this. He says, the world worries and has ample reason for doing so. It faces tremendous problems with no real solution for them. But the Christian is very differently situated. He is not of this world. He is not of this world. The last thing, <clears throat> this is what God offers us when he gives us peace. He says simply that if we keep our minds and our hearts on him, he will give us perfect peace. I'm going to read as a, as a last devotional. Hear my cry, O God. This is from Psalm 61, 1 through 4. Hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have given a shelter for me. You have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from my enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. Would anyone like to say a closing prayer for us? <clears throat> yeah, I'll, I'll say Thank something. Thank you, Mary. Yes, your <laughs> face came up. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, how we thank you so much for sharing your son, Jesus Christ, with us and in the world. How, how big and great your love is for us. We can't, we can't even surround and understand what, what, how great that love is, but that you gave your son and you gave him up so that we could live with you forever. And we, we thank you so much for the peace that you have given us, the understanding that peace cannot live in our hearts and joy reside there either. We need mm. to have joy, but we can't have joy without peace. And we do thank you for giving us those fruits that we can 
thrive on, that we can nurture ourselves with. And we, <clears throat> we ask that you continue through the Holy Spirit to keep us aware of our needs to pursue peace and to want peace and to nurture it and to try to spread it throughout our lives to those around us, to our community, to our church members, to those outside of our church, in our communities, and into the world. <clears throat> and we pray that we are worthy of the gifts that you have given us. And we thank you so much for all that you have done for us and that you continue to give to us each day. We pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.